Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second part of my, my workshop. Um, I heard that there are some technical glitches in terms of uh, uh, signing in. So hopefully I'll, I'll be able to finish this in time. If not, we can leave the Q&A to uh, emails. Okay, so let's start with the product lifecycle management. So you can see here, these are the list of a uh, range of estimates of the various development costs for each of uh, the product sectors listed here. These ranges take into account just the cost of research uh, and development, clinical testing, regulatory and approval cost. Uh, all these are prior to commercialization itself. So within some of these product sectors, as you can see, there are some which have extremely broad uh, range in terms of the amount spent on R&D and so forth. So for instance, within the in vitro diagnostic uh, sector, you, uh, you can see that there's a wide range from 5 million to 100 million. So why is this so? This is because for instance, in diagnostics, um, you, we, researchers or companies are using existing platform technologies which require less development costs to those that um, newer technology platforms. So for instance, a hypothetical new diagnostic test for the detection of a disease based on, say for instance, several newly identified proteins utilizing existing point of care lateral flow technology may be able to complete development and reach commercialization at the lower end of the cost range. Whereas the complex genetic test that uses RNA expression, for instance, to predict the likelihood of cancer uh, may require development costs at the upper end of the category. So a general rule is that an improvement in an existing diagnostic test, which is faster or more sensitive than a test already in the market, would most likely be at the lower end of the cost range, where else totally new platforms or new diagnostic categories will be at the higher end of the cost range. For all products, the overall cost for development increases in proportion to the amount of the, the lab, um, animal, human clinical data um, that you require to collect in order to demonstrate safe and safety and clinical efficacy. In addition, each of these development costs that I've mentioned are impacted by the types of technology used um, the target market, meaning the size, um, the complexity of it, and also the complexity of the product being developed. So let's look at therapeutics, biologics, and vaccines. We have those at the upper end of the product development cost, which can go up to say, for instance, $1.5 billion. Why is this so? Because this takes into account the estimated number of research failures encountered when advancing one successful product to commercialization. In fact, any one single therapeutic or biologic product development program may have development cost at the lower end of the range um, at you know, say $250 million. However, no one can predict which one will be successful. So most large um, and also medium-sized therapeutic companies would use upper end estimates that include the typical failure rates incurred along the way. Although we have the general range estimates for development cost here, uh, it is uh, critical to determine the more precise cost estimates for your particular product when creating and establishing a product development and business plan. Precise product development cost 
will help you assess the number of size of financing rounds required in order for your product to reach the various development milestones right up to commercialization. So understanding the process required to arrive at this um, accurate or as accurate product development cost estimates will help ensure that you don't run out of capital. And it will also assure investors that you understand the capital requirement for bringing your product to market. When calculating product development costs, be sure to also build within your estimates and allowance for unexpected events and contingency plans. Because rarely, if ever, do product development plans go according to your plan. So most of the time, unforeseen roadblocks, delays, and development challenges arise, which extend the originally estimated time frame and development cost for you. So when estimating product development cost, consider adding a contingency factor um, between 15 to 25% of the cost for certain development phases that uh, you think that are most unpredictable. Okay. So just as development costs vary, so do product development timeframes. Um, as previously mentioned, the product development timeframes are also impacted by the time spent on research development, uh, prototyping, animal testing, clinical testing, regulatory and approval process. So it is equally important to determine an accurate time frame required for your product to move from concept to each stage of product development and ultimately into the market. All healthcare biotech product sectors with the exception of digital health IT applications required numerous years to move a product from concept to development, to testing, regulatory approval, and to the marketplace. So because of the expansion and mass adoption of digital and IT, many digital health IT applications have emerged, which can potentially reach the market within say one to three years of product conceptualization. But this is different for therapeutics and diagnostics, uh, uh, therapeutics mainly, and biologics, which require 12 to 15 years to reach commerce, commercialization. And then you have uh, in vitro diagnostics and personalized medicine that is right at the center. So, Let's look at this typical project life cycle from a cash flow perspective. During the early research stage, project cash flows tend to be negative. Early stage research can take several years, but it's not as expensive as clinical development. The drug is launched upon marketing approval being issued, followed by relatively fast market penetration. A stable period of revenue generation follows, and finally, the revenue decline following the patent expiry. The project life cycle is such that even though the basic term of patent protection should be 20 years from the date of the application for the patent about, the period during which revenues can enjoy patent protection is effectively reduced to the patent term remaining after regulatory approval. I'll explain that in a minute. So financial models would vary on how far into the project life cycle um, that they forecast. Um, typically, um, they would forecast based on the patent expiry as the, tip, uh, as the end point, um, based on the revenues facing erosion by then. So patents are crucial to biotech companies in recouping the significant investment often required to get a product to the market. Patents are critical in maintaining the competitive advantage in the face of competition. Thus, it is important to build a strong patent portfolio around your products and manage your product lifecycle 
to maximize the exclusivity accorded by these patents. This requires sophisticated patent strategies and expertise. Close collaboration between you and your R&D team, the marketing team, and your patent attorneys are needed. You should avoid becoming complacent when you have your first patent covering a product, but you should strive to build a portfolio of multiple patents and patent families covering the product instead. Ideally, one should pursue multiple patents with stacked patent terms in an effort to extend the life of your patent protection. So timing for filing patent application is equally important. For products that take a long time to develop, consider delaying the filing of some patents so as to maximize the overlap between the patent term and the commercialization stage of the product life. But beware that if you delay patent filing, um, you may incur the risk of losing the first to file priority status and thus the right to obtain such a patent. So timing in filings is important in minimizing the prior art as well as avoiding creating prior art against your own company's uh, patents covering perhaps the same product. So let's look at two examples. Uh, one is Roach PCR patent portfolio, which is a good example of successful IP strategies. Um, after Hoffman LaRoche acquired the fundamental PCR patents from CITES, he proceeded to acquire and file additional patents and build a comprehensive patent portfolio. In particular, this patent portfolio Portfolio includes a large number of patents with different expiration dates covering different aspects of the PCR process and its various applications. So what is so brilliant about Roach strategy? It is that these patents form thick picket fences around the PCR technology and since late 1980s with patent expiration dates between 2005 and 2017 or later, which, has, which had largely withstood patent challenges and generated hundreds of millions of dollars for the company. So in other words, they didn't let that 20 uh, year term exclusivity limit um, to limit uh, them in terms of their patent strategy. Another example is Merck's patent coverage on Fosamax, which illustrates a sound patent strategy in a difficult situation. So for Fosamax, um, which is a, a blockbuster drug for treating osteoporosis, um, it has this active ingredient called alandronate sodium, which was already publicly known by the time the licensor, which is a research institution based in Italy, discovered it for treating osteoporosis. And thus, what that means is that they were not able to uh, patent this chemical compound or even the pharmaceutical composition. So the licensor instead filed a patent and was granted a US patent. It's just a method of use patent instead. And after Merck licensed that program, it created multiple patents with stack patent terms extending its exclusivity until 2008. While some of these patents eventually were invalidated or revoked in litigation or oppositions, the portfolio as a whole was sufficient to protect Fosamax for an extended period of time even though the chemical entity of the drug was not protected by a claim to the compound itself. Of note, even before Merck lost this exclusivity for Fosamax, they developed uh, Fosamax Plus D, which is a combination of alandronate sodium and vitamin D. So this is a second generation product. And so likewise, um, for Cermax Plus D is covered by multiple patents. So this is an example of sufficient prote uh, patent protection 
which may sometimes be established in difficult situations and provided that your patent strategies are created and followed through the drug development process. However, um, as we know, many biotechnology developments that showed promise to blossom into life-saving products were aborted at the research stage, never to be fully developed. And this is largely due to the lack of the patent protection um, strategy that would have justified the enormous investment um, made. Therefore, you as an entrepreneur and um, inventor should work closely with experienced patent counsel and stay vigilant in capturing and creating patentable inventions through the entire process of product development and even thereafter for second generation products. Uh, uh, let's look at this um, example of top drug um, launches uh, and their product life cycle. And we'll focus on Remicid and Humira, which stood out in their ability to extend their market exclusivity. So let's look at Remicid first, which is this one here. Remicid is used in the treatment of various autoimmune conditions, including Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, rheumatoid arthritis, and so forth. So Remicid was the world's fourth best-selling drug at its peak, making $8 billion a year, which earned the manufacturer anywhere between $18,000 to $25,000 per patient per year. So how did Remicade survive 18 years of exclusivity? They filed various patent applications, delayed prosecution of one of the patents to extend its term. And over the following seven years before the patent was granted, the claims were amended numerous times and claims that were covered by an earlier patent were added. So that was the layering that I mentioned earlier. Then let's look at Humira, which is this one here. Humira also uh, a first line biologic for autoimmune diseases for uh, arthritis and psoriasis picked in 2019 with about $21.4 billion in global deals. Although biosimilars have eaten their market share since then uh, in the Europe, Humira is still able to maintain its market exclusivity up till 2023 in the US and thus maintain its position as the highest selling drug. So what is one similar pattern that we observe for these pharmaceutical products here? Um, they share the same barbell Pattern. So they ultimately face the same issue. And what is that? Patent clips or the expiration of exclusivity periods for their drugs. So why is that this patent cliff and that significant drop in revenue? Because um, the past this effective patent exclusivity period, biosimilars and generic drugs will eat at the revenue and hence at their profit. So these are questions that you can reflect on as you, um, you think about your patent, your patent and IP strategy. Let's go into product regulatory and market roadmap. Most of the examples that, are fo uh, that follows would uh, either be uh, based on FDA or CE, um, which are the most, um, and, uh, FDA obviously because it's one of the most highly regulated industry in the world. So let's go to first regulatory exclusivity. So we know that it takes about 10 years to get um, FDA or uh, even regulatory approval anywhere as only one in thousand compounds which begin lab testing will make it to human testing and 12% of drugs entering clinical trials will result in an approved medicine. So how are drug makers compensated for the hundreds of millions to billions even spent for an extensive amount of time? Um, 
excluding the patent um, exclusivity, uh, which we discussed at great length, new drugs can also be protected by regulatory exclusivity. For example, exclusive marketing rights granted by the FDA under certain conditions. So regulatory exclusivity um, is independent of patents, which we should not be confused to be, and can run concurrently with patents. There are sev several important ones, which I will go into uh, uh, detail, which is the orphan drug, the ex uh, pediatric and the data exclusivity. Orphan drug exclusivity is granted by the FDA and other countries for products to treat rare diseases and conditions affecting fewer than 200,000 pa uh, patients. It prohibits approval of another application for such drug for such disease or condition for seven years after the initial product approval. Then you have pediatric exclusivity, which is granted to extend expiration dates of other forms of exclusivity, including um, data exclusivity and orphan drug exclusivity by six months if the drug developer conducts pedi pediatric trials of the drug. Then you have data exclusivity, which is the most, uh, one of the most important one here um, of the of the regulatory exclusivity. Um, this data exclusivity is sometimes referred to as marketing exclusivity. Uh, it's a form of protection which prohibits during a defined period of time after a new drug approval, any reliance by a third party on the data generated for the new drug for purpose of obtaining approval for generics. So generally within five or so, five or more years, um, data exclusivity is given. The prospective competitor seeking approval of a gene generic may not file uh, an abbreviated new drug approval during the five year after the FDA approval for the so-called uh, brand name drug. Okay, so it is important to recognize that regulatory requirements and pathways continuously change. And it is incumbent upon you as the entrepreneur to understand current regulations and pathways for regulatory approval of your product in all countries where you intend to commercialize your product. At present, it takes years to get a product from basic research to FDA approval. The question then is, is this likely to change in the future? I would think so because there are a lot of efforts taken in terms of even um, trying to make clinical trials more efficient. Um, but then again, there are um, even exceptions in recent year, right? Um, so one of the exceptions is COVID-19 vaccines. Um, all of us know that COVID-19 Vaccines took less than a year from conception to trial ready um, and to distribution. So how was that possible? What, what one can rush is paperwork, manufacturing of the vaccine doses, number of bureaucratic steps that take place at the same time as the trials were underway. So normally all these factors would have to wait until after completion of a trial, but then pandemic led to many things happening in tandem. So typically after a compiled data on a clinical trial proved effectiveness and safety, the dossier is presented to the regulator for approval to be used for the general public. But in the case of COVID-19 vaccines, the regulator granted emergency use authorization instead. So emergency use authorization or EUA for short is a mechanism to facilitate the availability and use of medical countermeasures. And in this case, the COVID-19 vaccine during public 
health emergencies. In other words, emergency approval is granted faster than traditional approval, which was necessary as deaths and severe illnesses rules. So the risk of the moment was weighed against the COVID crisis and against the minimal increase in knowledge one might gain by following the trials longer. It does not mean approval without normal safeguards in place. So after receiving an EUA, it's expected that manufacturers will continue clinical trials to collect data that they can use when they apply to full regulatory approval. Volunteers who participated in the trials continue to be monitored to track their antibody levels and any related reactions. The manufacturers will track all of its phase three participants for two years to assess long-term protection and safety. The first piece of information, um, so other than that, the first piece of information that scientists needed was the genetic sequence of this new coronavirus and the virus genome was sequenced and made available uh, pretty quick by mid-January last year. So at that point, the genetic similarity between this new coronavirus and SARS specifically was noticed. So this meant that the scientists weren't starting completely from scratch when it came to quickly developing vaccines. Before a clinical trial even began, scientists used preclinical models to whittle down list of potential vaccine targets. They're looking for the targets that elicit the strongest immune response with good safety profile. So having this valuable information based on preclinical models, uh, which we wouldn't have done so a couple of years back, expedited the vaccine development tremendously. Another advantage that we uh, as a whole are benefiting from in terms of vaccine development is the power of plenty because the sheer number of vaccine candidates for one specific disease is extraordinary, never seen before. It's helping us to make up for the trial and error process that often accompanies vaccine development. Of these vaccine candidates, some use different targets, some use different technology, and have been this level of diversity and saturation is a powerful position to be in. So if one vaccine candidate isn't effective, then it falls out of clinical trial, but a more effective one is likely right in the wake. So as we speak, there's still, um, still many vaccine candidates um, that are in the pipeline even today, despite of the launch of several other vaccines in the market. So we are likely, all heard by now that there is a new technology being used in uh, that that the, that there has been new technology being used for COVID nineteen vaccines, um, uh, which basically avoids the requirement of loads and loads of virus to first be produced. So one of it is mRNA vaccines, and then of course there are other new vaccine technologies. Rather, these new classes of vaccines rely on material that can be synthesized in the lab quickly. So this, among other things, make them very quick to develop. In addition, this technology is likely to work against uh, and has been proven to work against multiple variants. The other critical component of bringing these new types of vaccines to the public quickly is funding. There is unprecedented financial support, both from the government and private sector. And given the need to take control of this pandemic, governments, corporates, foundations across the globe have financially backed the most promising vaccine candidates. It allows for newer, faster vaccine technology to be rolled out and expedited the vaccine distribution in a way we've never seen before. 
Typically, vaccine manufacturers would have to wait to produce large quantities of vaccines until after it's approved by the regulators. And depending on the type of vaccines, this large scale production can take months. So this is not the case for the COVID-19 vaccines, which received tremendous amount of support, um, especially from the government in terms of manufacturing um, um, in order to basically fulfill um, the, the, the needed number of vaccines around the globe. So let's go to the discovery pipeline for therapeutics. Um, disease animal models are most commonly used to evaluate the effects of a potential therapeutic. However, disease animal models are imperfect representations of actual disease uh, because mice are not people and there are biochemical, metabolic and genetic differences between species. So especially if we looked at the elderly, uh, for instance, current life expectancy at birth is now approximately 78 years. Mice, in contrast, can live only up to a year in the wild and about two to three years in controlled environment. Since many diseases of the elderly are thought to be at least in part the result of long-term subtle toxic environmental exposure, mice arguably do not make good model for such diseases. Even patients with a specific disease are not identical. As a result, patients do not respond in the same way, even to well-established drugs. Clinical studies have shown, say for instance, that 10 to 30% of patients will not respond to a selected anti-hypertensive ACE inhibitor. 15 to 25% of heart failure patients will not respond to selected beta blocker. Mind boggling is 20 to 50% of patients will not respond to a specific SSRI antidepressant. So thus, even for well-established therapies, the physicians will often try different members of a drug class on their patient until they find one that works for them. Given these limitations, on average, only 30% of target validation projects are successful, meaning that the tested targets appears to provide benefits in treating the disease. A target identification and validation study would typically take a year and cost about $500,000 to a $1 million to complete. If the target is not validated, this is a sunk cost and the research team proceeds to the next candidate. However, an even worse outcome is the incorrect validation of the drug target and this happens. In this case, work goes forward with mounting cost for a project that is ultimately doomed to fail. In assay development and high throughput screening, once a therapeutic target is validated, the next step is to identify chemical compounds that act on the target in the desired way. So this requires a screening assay, a biological or biochemical test that can clearly distinguish between active compounds that produce the desired effect and inactive compounds that do not interact with the target. The screening assay must be relatively inexpensive since a few hundred thousand compounds are commonly tested in a typical screening campaign. If each assay fully loaded for reagents, labor, lab automation and other overhead costs 10 cents per assay, expenses for the screening campaign alone will be about 20,000. And this is not counting the expenditure for assay design and validation, which may reasonably amount to $200,000 to $300,000 per campaign. So the assay must also be highly sensitive. At this point, we are looking for a chemical lead, not a finished draft, 
So one must expect that the crude chemical lead will have low potency that will be improved by subsequent chemical synthesis. Only a sensitive assay can detect such crude weak leads. So the assay must be selective for the activity of interest. All biological assays are subject to artifacts and identify compounds that are not real hits. If such artifacts are both rare and anticipated ahead of time, then this can be easily weeded out through subsequent experimentation. But if they are common and confused with real hits, the entire campaign may fail. So screening can commence once the assay is designed and validated. The question at this point for you is what samples and how many of them to screen? Today's screening campaigns are typically smaller, uh, uh, rationally assembled clinic, uh, chemical libraries. And so thus a campaign could include 50,000 to 200,000 rationally selected compounds um, to be reason reasonably tested for a good volume of chemical space. Assay development, validation, and implementation typically in aggregate takes about a year and cost about one million or more. The overall success rate for this research phase is about 65%. Failures can be due to the developed assays for some uh, due to be due to the difficult to develop assays for some biological processes, especially when the assay needs to meet the difficult combined criteria of low cost, robustness, ease and speed of operation, high selectivity and freedom from artifact. Then second, um, there are times where not all targets are equally druggable, a term meaning that the target activity can be modified by the action of drug or drug-like chemical. So hopefully at the end of the screen, we have a hit list. What should a reasonable hit list look like? Um, it should be probably about 0.1% to 0.01% that is workable for most labs. So that means for 200,000 samples, we're expecting to produce about 20 actives. These actives are then characterized biologically and chemically to produce leads for the chemical optimization process. Artifacts are removed in so far as possible via biological secondary assays and the potency and efficacy of the true heats are then determined. In general, it is best to focus work on high potency and efficacy actives since these compounds provide a starting point that is closer to the ultimately desired drug. Finding similar compounds repeatedly is generally a good sign that the screen ran well since it would be reasonable to expect that certain chemical structure types will be best able to hit your target of interest. Chemical compounds that are structurally related to the actives are then purchased and tested to crudely identify which chemical features are needed to produce activity. It is a bad sign if the heat compound is active, but all related compounds are inactive. What does that mean? It means that it will be very difficult for you to find chemical analogs with improved activity. And then if we look at the other side of the coin, it is a bad sign if virtually all analogs are active, which means that the heat is working indiscriminately, possibly because of its chemical reactive properties rather than because of its selective action on target. All the prior information is used to select two to three actives as leads for further work. In many cases, the biologist's favorite hits will be different from the chemist's favorite hits. This is because each group looks at the results through their own lenses and through their own scientific discipline and training. 
the biologists and chemists have different but equally valid perspective on the drug discovery process. Successful projects should incorporate the perspective of both disciplines. Lead discovery typically takes about a year at this point, employing expanded staff and at an average cost of over $1.5 to $2 million. The success rate is again 65%. Failure is typically caused by poor leads or in some cases, no leads. Poor leads have weak biological activity, suggesting that it will require extreme effort to bring the lead to a point where it will have clinically relevant activity. Poor leads can also be chemically intractable with difficult multi-step synthesis and poor potential analog design. So once a lead is selected, the next step in the process is lead optimization with a preliminary knowledge established regarding which chemical features are needed to carry the desired biological activity. It is common to now refer to the lead as scaffold, which will now be decorated with chemical substituents to produce the final drug molecule. Analogs are made and then tested in multiple biological systems, initially in test tube and later in cells and lab animals. Obviously, analogs will be tested for improved potency and efficacy against the target because highly potent and efficacious compound can be dosed at low levels, reducing the potential side effects. Testing is also conducted for selectivity to ensure that the compound acts on the target of interest and not on similar proteins. Commonly, assays for the most closely related enzymes or receptors are established and run as a counter screen looking for inactivity or low potency. So it is preferable that these drugs must act in the body of living organisms and not just in the test tube at the very early phase. Thus this would be early assurance that not only did the compound hit the target of interest, but then it was also pharmacologically well behaved in animals. So the sooner the better, realistically, however, the current discovery model defers animal testing largely because in vitro testing is less expensive, quicker and higher throughput. So there are uh, five types of pharmacological properties that we would put at um, to char characterize how a drug behaves in the body. And in vitro test tube based assays are available to roughly measure each of these five pharmacological properties, which is absorption, distribution, metabolism, elimination, and toxicity. And such assays are currently employed during the lead optimization stage at the early stages in place of animal testing. Once the lead optimization is completed, then only is the drug ready to begin its preclinical trials, which is mainly the animal testing. So we'll talk about clinical transition studies in the prior slide. The goal of uh, clinical trial, uh, clinical transition studies is to demonstrate the safety of the drug before it is first dosed in humans. And so from this step onwards, every experiment and study that is carried out will be reviewed by regulatory authorities. Most every country has their own regulatory agency that reviews and approves human therapeutics and many of their requirements for approval are similar. So the examples here, as I've mentioned earlier, is based on FDA. The regulator's involvement starts with the phase one clinical study via the approval of the manufacturer's investigational new drug application, or in short, IND. The IND application consists of the results from a highly defined set of studies 
designed to demonstrate the safety of new pharmaceutical agents and the consistency of the manufacturing process to which they will be produced. The core set of experiments conducted to support the submission of an IND dossier is commonly called the clinical transition studies, so a, which is the prior steps. A battery of specific studies is required to be included in the IND application. Although all scientists are trained to carry out experiments in a carefully designed and executed fashion, and to record observations with high precision, studies intended for submission to a regulatory agency are in addition subject to a system of management controls called the good laboratory practice. So let's look at phase one trials. Phase one trials involve healthy volunteers, not patients primarily with the primary aim to assess the safety of the new drug and these volunteers are financially compensated for their participation in a manner consistent with ethical considerations. The phase one study will produce data on the pharmacokinetics of the drug and its pharmacodynamic properties. These studies are conducted under what is called open label format which means everyone is aware of what drugs and doses are being given. There are commonly two components for phase one trial. One is to raise the doses in the study in increasingly higher amount uh, administered to the participants. This is to determine how much drug can be given without producing negative effects. This is followed by a multi-dose study in which one or more selected doses is administered repeatedly over time to determine the long-term effects of the drug. So such studies commonly involve say 20 to 80 subjects and take about six months to complete. The cost for such study is about $3 million or more with an overall historical success rate of 70%. The aim of phase two clinical trials is to test the safety and uh, to test the safety and in a preliminary fashion, the effectiveness of a therapeutic candidate compound in patients with the targeted disease. Phase two design most commonly includes control group that is not given the drug instead receiving a placebo. In many illnesses, especially those in which the measurement of disease severity is difficult to quantify, this placebo can show substantial effects. Patients are carefully randomized into the control and drug groups to ensure that average disease severity is the same in the two groups. A related common practice is the blind trial that is not to inform patients as to whether they are receiving the drug or placebo. And then in other cases, the physician may also not be informed as to whether the test agent or placebo is being administered. And this is called the double blind study. So data from the phase two trial are used to select a dose reg regimen amount, the frequency, and the duration for expanded and hopefully conclusive studies in a large group of patients in phase three. So because phase two trials have dual and sequential goals, they are commonly divided into two subphases, which is phase 2A and phase 2B. Phase 2A concentrates on safety and dosing while well, phase 2B is an extension of 2A with an increased focus on efficacy. The number of patients in phase 2 study can range anywhere between 50 to 500. It takes about one to two years or more to complete depending on the study design. A cost ranging from three to 
uh, 5 million range would be typical for an academically led study with industrial studies um, costing more than this. So the historical success rate for phase two has been on the order of 50%. The goal of phase three trial is to unambiguously show whether or not a new compound is effective in treating the target disease. These trials are termed pivotal in the industry because they will make or break um, the success of a particular drug. The design of the phase three trials combine scientific and financial considerations. If a drug is highly effective, only a relatively small number of patients may be needed to show a statistically significant positive effect. So let me give you a drastic example of this. If every patient who does not take the drug quickly dies and every patient taking the drug survives, we do not need to be a statistician to conclude that only a small number of patients will be needed to produce convincing data set. However, a larger, if a larger number of patients will be needed, if the effect of the drug is small. So for example, patients with ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease typically live three to five years um, post-diagnosis. So um, we know of Bryozol, one of the only drugs clinically approved for the treatment of ALS extends life on average by two to three months. So the phase three study to register Rhizol included more than 1,200 patients, significant number who were treated for two years. The study size which was needed to convincingly demonstrate in a statistically significant fashion that the drug produced um, this small positive effect. Well, from a scientific perspective, it is critical to ensure that the phase three study is adequately powered. Financial considerations come into play, um, especially for biopharmaceutical or biotechnology companies. So the design is geared um, towards a trial of minimum size that effectively meets the desired goal a consideration that is intimately tied to statistical power is how drug effectiveness will be determined, commonly called the outcome measures. So as in phase two trials, this is especially important in cases where there is subjectivity in assessing effectiveness. This is mostly tied to neuropsychiatric diseases. So variation in patient response to a drug is another issue that impacts the power of clinical trial. Even well-established FDA approval drugs, as I mentioned earlier, can vary in their effectiveness in different patients. In extreme cases, 70% of the patients will not respond to a drug that is highly efficacious in the other 30% of patients. Since patient response cannot be predicted ahead of time, um, although this will, this has been changing due to personalized medicine studies, um, this, and also AI, uh, AI studies, the size of the phase three trial may have to be increased to provide statistically significant results in a patient population that include large number of non-responders. Phase three trials can be three to five years in duration, costing 50 to 100 million or more. Historically, approximately 65% of phase three trials have been successful. Fortunately, once a drug achieves statistically significant efficacy in treating a disease, the FDA will approve the drug for sale um, 95 percent of the time, following the NDA approval, the drug goes on sale and will then be used for the first time to treat extremely large number of patients. 
the manufacturer is required to collect safety data on the product while it is in the market and to periodically analyze this data to look for any indication of safety issue that was not revealed during phase three trial. It is estimated that about 20% of new drugs will be recalled from the market as a result of safety issues only identified after the drug is used to treat large number of patients. So let's go to in vitro diagnostics. Um, in the diagnostic sector in the US and similarly in other countries, a company will develop a detection technology for an analyte of interest, whether it's molecule or chemical, then produce and manufacture a kit which is sold to others who perform this diagnostic test. Um, there is another business model, which is the clinical laboratory service model that can be an alternative for these companies. In this model, molecular and diagnostic companies perform unique and proprietary tests as a service rather than to provide the kit operating through a single company-owned clinical lab. So there are several advantages to the lab services business model as opposed to the kit manufacturing model. These include um, a shorter time frame from inception of test technology to product commercialization, generally lower cost of product and service development, fewer employees requirement. And most importantly, the lab services run on an alternative regulatory part called the clinical laboratory improvement assessment, rather than the more stringent FDA regulatory approval, um, which requires, in addition, uh, quality systems and clinical validation. So there are also disadvantage to the business model over the traditional diagnostic kit manufacturing model. This includes the testing services can only be performed in one lab location, which potentially limit the volume of testing and creates a bottleneck for the company. Testing requires specialized employees who have the expertise to perform these testing services. Regulatory approval includes biannual lab inspection and proficiency testing, which if not compliant, can shut down or restrict all services for a period of time. If you are into in vitro diagnostics, you may uh, want to consider choosing one business over the other for strategic reasons and for competitive advantages. For instance, a very complex and highly technical test that is very difficult and labor, labor intensive to perform may be challenging to reduce to a kit, allowing others to perform proficiently and accurately. So such a complex test may require specialized equipment that must be developed by you and adequately perform the test with consistency. So in this case, the clinical laboratory business model may be a better choice instead. So the typical development, but let's focus on in vitro diagnostic as a kit, um, which has to go through the FDA uh, pathway. The typical development process of the and in vitro diagnostic assays, lengthy and tedious process is illustrated here, where the regulatory pathway goes through several key milestones from feasibility in phase one to design and optimization in phase 2A to verification in phase 2A or 2B to validation in phase three before getting clearance. So the development process is focused on demonstrating that the assay's analytical performance reflects the capability of detecting the analyte in an accurate and reproducible manner. 
as well as the clinical performance of the assay. Development timelines for IBD in vitro diagnostic products are partially impacted by the inherent regulatory requirements and the need to fulfill data expectations. The regulatory requirements for in vitro diagnostics are market dependent and can vary substantially on where the product is to be registered. So the FDA considers in vitro diagnostics as medical devices subject to pre-market. The level of control required to establish safe and efficacy effective use of the device is dictated by the FDA's risk-based classification system established for in vitro diagnostic products and categorizes these into class one, class two, or class three devices, class three being the most high risk device. This classification system outlines the compliance requirement that will guide the development of in vitro diagnostics and whether subsequent regulatory pathway will require a pre market notification or what we usually call the 510K or submission of a pre-market approval application for marketing authorization. The perceived level of risk is a reflection of the intended use of the in vitro diagnostics. And there are examples where the FDA has approved assays detecting exactly the same analyte under different regulatory pathways, depending on how these assays uh, are intended to be employed. So for example, um, the BioMariux VIDAS total PSA assay, which is indicated as an aid in the detection of prostate cancer was approved by FDA under the pre-market approval pathway. Due to the perceived high level of risk to the patient for subsequent follow-up and treatment. In contrast, the Nadia Prosview PSA assay, which is indicated for use of prognostic marker in conjunction with clinical evaluation as an aid in identifying those patients at reduced risk for the recurrence of prostate cancer and monitoring the recurrence of prostate cancer is perceived as a lower level of risk to patients who had already been treated and therefore received clearance under the 510K pathway. So it's good to know that the majority of in vitro diagnostics uh, reviewed by FDA are cleared by 510K products. The marketing application process for an in vitro diagnostic is intended to provide sufficient information varying the product has been validated to ensure it is safe and effective for its intended use. So in some cases, class one products with low risk may be exempt from pre-market submissions. For in vitro diagnostic with low to moderate risk, then the 510K submission process requires a sponsor to demonstrate that the product is substantially equivalent to a pre-existing or predicate device already cleared by FDA for the same intended use. Establishing substantial equivalence requires the submission of basic data requirements to provide the FDA with a reasonable assurance that the product is safe and effective. In addition to demonstrating general controls are in place, the submission of preclinical data on the analytical performance of the assay, illustrating accuracy, precision, limit of detection, linearity, and cross-reactivity is also required. So while 510K filings do not generally require performing a clinical trial, 
the need to include clinical data varies on the assay being evaluated and its intended use. So if the FDA determines substantial equivalence has been demonstrated to either a reference method, which is the gold standard, or a predicate device for the same intended use, the in vitro diagnostics will be cleared for marketing. So the average time for the 510K device um, to be cleared by the FDA is approximately five months with approximately 73% um, of those reviewed determined to be substantially equivalent and cleared for marketing. Now in vitro diagnostic designated as high risk device, which is class three, are required to submit the pre-market approval application instead. This would include assays that are used to diagnose a life-threatening diseases and assays utilized as companion diagnostics and used to determine the course of treatment. In, co in contrast to the 510K application, the pre-market approval filing does not seek to establish substantial equivalence to a pre-existing product, while a a, a pre-market approval application will include preclinical data, unlike that of the 510K, on its analytical performance. So pre-market approval filings are required to include a more comprehensive demonstration of its safety uh, and effective use. Therefore, a sponsor submitting a pre-market approval application is required to perform a clinical trial and generate clinical data illustrating the test performs according to its intended use. So this is a significant addition to that of what we would see for the 510K approval pathway. The testing is required to be performed in a setting representative of whether it, where it is intended to be sold. In addition to the submission of the preclinical and clinical data, um, the pre-market approval applications are also required to include information on design control and manufacturing of the in vitro diagnostic products. So sponsors, of the pre-market approval applications are subject to inspections prior to approval to assure adherence to quality system regulations and implementing of good manufacturing practices to ensure that the in vitro diagnostics are safe and effective. So the keyword always in this whole regulatory pathway is safe and effective. A key feature to mitigate regulatory risk for you is the availability to you as sponsors to engage feedback from the agency via the pre-investigation device, which we call the pre-IDE meeting. This mechanism allows sponsors to seek advice and clarification from FDA on matters pertaining to the intended use of the assay clinical protocol design, validation procedures, and other parameters required for approval. Although not binding on the FDA's part, pre-IDE meetings can provide valuable information and guidance on the FDA's expectations. Then the average number of days between filing the pre-market approval application and the receipt of the decision um, whether it's approved or not approved, is approximately 15 months, with approximately 68% of this being accepted for uh, of this being accepted for regulatory approval. So let's look at CE, um, which is uh, uh, in, uh, most in the Europe, consists uh, which consists of several classifications, not too dissimilar from the FDA. Once your company has determined the risk classification of the device, 
then you must determine which conformity assessment procedure you will follow to receive CE marking approval. I find this to be a bit more complicated than the FDA um, pathway, but the conformity assessment procedures available for each classification are identified in the medical device directive, which you can um, look at. So if you recall for FDA class one devices are ex uh, uh, mostly exempted from uh, pre-market notification approval um, if it's low risk. So likewise for CE mark, um, they give a more uh, definite, uh, they give a more definite ex uh, explanation. Class one device that is non-sterile and non-measuring then would not require a notified body. However, all other products will require your company to select a notified body. If your company does not require a notified body involvement, then you will be able to issue a declaration of conformity in accordance with Annex 7. You will also need to register your product with one of the competent authorities in Europe. And if you do not have a physical presence in Europe, you will also need to select a European authorized representative. If your medical device is any other class apart from class one, you will have to provide the notified body with proof that your product fulfills the essential requirements of the respective CE directives. So most companies use the Annex 2 conformity assessment process to achieve CE marking. In this process, the notified body reviews the technical file and quality systems for conformity with regulatory requirements in the applicable, uh, applicable directives. So as part of the Annex 2 process, the notified body will have to audit your design process to ensure that you have the adequate design controls and that your process for establishing and maintaining a technical file is adequate. Once your company has adequately addressed um, any findings from the audit, the notified body will issue your company a full quality assurance CE certificate. So once you have this certificate, you will be able to launch new products without prior approval from the notified body, so long as it's within the scope of this Annex 2. The Annex 5 conformity assessment process is the most common route to ECE marking for most companies as the, they outsource product design to third party. So if your company outsources design, and you cannot demonstrate full quality assurance as previously mentioned, then the, then the notified body will issue you the Annex 5 CE certificate for product, production quality assurance. Then you have the Annex 3 conformity assessment process, which is a type of examination that is performed for higher risk devices where the company does not have the Annex 2 certificate. This type of examination involves a review of your company's design dossier and the notified body issues a type examination CE certificate. But the thing is this certificate cannot be used alone. Um, it has to be used in conjunction with others so say for instance, the Annex 5 certification for production quality insurance. So this combination would be used mainly for class 2B and class 3 devices in place of the Annex 2 certification. So um, let's look at um, the classification in detail. Medical device class 1, have the lowest perceived risk if your product is class one and it's not sterile, it's not measuring device, then all you need is self-certification as earlier mentioned and formally declare its compliance with the applicable requirements 
of the uh, medical device directive. If it's sterile or measuring a medical device, then you will still need a notified body assessment. Then we have a medical device of class 2A, which includes surgical gloves, hearing aids, and diagnostic ultrasound machines. These constitute the low to medium risk um, range. Patients should use them for a short term period and meeting less than 30 days. So if you are a manufacturer of class 2A, you will have to back up your declaration of compliance with a notified body assessment. Only then you will be allowed to place your product in the market. Then you have class 2B. We can include medical devices such as long-term corrective contact lenses, surgical lasers and defibrillators and others. These are medium to high risk devices and patients may use them for a longer period, longer than 30 days in class 2A. So in case your product is in class 2B, similar to the procedures in class 2A, you will need a notified body to assess your technical documentation for compliance with the medical device directive. In class three, all medical devices have the highest risk possible and permanent monitoring is required during their lifetime. There are specialized institutions responsible for conducting the products monitoring. Such devices are, for instance, the cardiovascular catheters, the aneurysm clips, hip joint implants, and prosthetic heart valves. Here, and also in class two, the conformity assessment of the medical devices may include an audit and technical documentation and a quality system of product inspection and to be focused on one or more aspects of the device design and production. Um, then we are going to talk briefly about combination diagnostic as it's becoming more and more of a trend. Developing a diagnostic assay to select patients most likely to benefit in parallel with therapeutic requires even more planning and execution because you need to align the two complex development pathways. Furthermore, the FDA has asserted that any corresponding diagnostic assay that support the safe and effective use of therapeutic must first be an FDA approved assay. This additional regulatory requirement therefore must be achieved prior to the therapeutic being approved for commercialization. So although developers of therapeutics that require a companion diagnostic products have the option of developing their own companion diagnostic device, most like the core competency. So in the alternative approach for most is to partner with an in vitro diagnostic developer to provide this accompanying diagnostic product. Those capable of placing the companion diagnostic wherever the therapeutic partner intends to sell, its targeted therapies would appear to be the partners of choice so they will look at the global outreach of this in vitro diagnostic um, providers. So the new paradigm of co-development creates these significant opportunities for developers of in vitro diagnostic to participate in the emerging field of personalized medicine. In vitro de uh, diagnostic developers will see their assays establish a new standard of care and segment the market into optimal responders and spare those who would not benefit from this particular therapeutic. It also afford these developers an opportunity to bring innovative technologies to the market as those with efficient technology platforms capable of providing comprehensive information from minimal amounts of material. So, however, this co-development process may be viewed as disruptive for both the therapeutic and the diagnostic companies compared to the way that it has been traditionally operating and developed their respective products. 
So aligning the development of in vitro diagnostic and therapeutic still is a challenge that will need to be addressed. The therapeutic partner needs to be assured of the feasibility of the approach, while the diagnostic developer needs to be incentivized to maintain engagement and provide these innovative products. So for example, therapeutic companies have traditionally controlled all aspects of the development and marketing of their product. Those who have been brought into the development cycle have usually been compensated on a fee or service schedule, such as contract manufacturing organizations. Now, companion diagnostics and like all uh, in vitro diagnostics are considered medical devices and are subject to pre-market controls as explained earlier. And essentially, most of these would fall under the class three classification, which is subjected to pre-market approval application for marketing authorization. So therefore, when used as companion diagnostic, in vitro diagnostics have a high level of regulatory requirement to achieve which in turn has implications on the development timeline of these in vitro diagnostic products and when it can be available to be incorporated into clinical trials for validation as companion diagnostic. When used a companion diagnostic unless initiated early in the drug development process, there is a risk of not having the in vitro diagnostic available at the start of a pivotal clinical trial for patient selection. And thus this impacts and delays the development timeline for the therapeutic company. So prior to integrating the assay into its clinical validation phase of development, the in vitro diagnostic will have had to complete their analytical validation in which the performance of the assay has been optimized and the design and specification of the assay has been verified. So essentially, in vitro diagnostic product would have to complete at least phase 2A or 2B design and verification, at which time the assay design is considered frozen and can now move on to clinical validation of phase 3 of their development. So it is not until the conclusion of design and verification, which may take up to two years, that a prototype version of this in vitro diagnostic assay can be manufactured and utilized as an investigational used only assay for validation in a clinical setting for the therapeutic partner. So for the execution of clinical validation in phase three, it is envisioned that the therapy therapeutic product and corresponding companion diagnostic will be developed simultaneously and the clinical performance and utility of the investigation used only assay will be demonstrated using data from clinical development program of this paired therapeutic product. Ideally, the clinical data is generated prospectively by stratifying the patients for inclusion into clinical trial for treatment with the paired therapeutic and clinical utility established when the patient outcome data is correlated with the results of the companion diagnostic. However, there have been cases where the data is validated retrospectively, so there is chiogen um, Terra screen class assay. So if an investigational use only assay is not available to meet the timeline for the therapeutic company, the alternative option is to alleviate the time requirement challenges by using the laboratory developed test instead. So in contrast to the in vitro diagnostics, which are developed with strict adherence to design controls and quality system regulations. As I mentioned earlier in the slides, laboratory developed tests can be developed 
and validated by individual testing labs in as little as six months for use in the facility only. So laboratory developed test assays have the advantage of bypassing the rigorous development requirements associated with the in vitro diagnostic and therefore represents the least impact on timeline for initial clinical testing. So although the paired products are dependent on each other's regulatory approval for market access, there is a universal absence of structure allowing for the simultaneous submission and review of the paired products as one regulatory path. So this regulatory harmonization, um, the lack of it is evident across all markets, even in the Europe. In Japan, the process for the simultaneous review of therapeutic and diagnostic pairs still lags behind. And in China, they are still trying to refine the, even the, the, the diagnostic development. So establishing a uniform process for simultaneous review and approval will create a more efficient system and help to mitigate risk in the co-development program. So if you are in this um, area, um, I think that you will need to pay attention in terms of the, uh, the regulatory development. So, so let's take a break, a short break here, um, five to 10 minutes before we go into ethical considerations. Uh, Take a breather because the ethical consideration is going to be a lot lighter than this earlier slides um, that we've been going through. All right, thanks, Ross. Let's take a break.
Okay, let's begin the next part of the today's workshop. I have I hope everyone had a good break. So biotech healthcare is going through what every other emerging scientific discipline experiences, which is the challenge of defining its ethical boundaries. In an age where medical technology continuously improves and at an increasingly rapid uh, uh, rapid uh, phase, the availability of new treatments increases almost as quickly. So with advances, however, come dilemmas, whether it's scientific, financial, and especially moral. So these conundrums are likely to multiply as groups with vastly different viewpoints and resources battle over the direction of health policy. But I think it's important for us to address this. Um, it's, it is our responsibility, whether we are a bio researcher or a bio entrepreneur to address the ethical considerations that may impact the public. So um, how best to go about this is to give you um, case studies to ponder on the, um, some of the more recent um, events that uh, took place. So the first one is the case of Jess Helsinger. Um, not sure if any of you are familiar with this. So 17 year old Jesse Gelsinger had a genetic disease called ornithine transcarbamylase or OTC deficiency. OTC deficiency prevents the body from breaking down ammonia a metabolic waste product. In patients with this disease, the excessive buildup of ammonia would often lead to death soon after birth, unless the patient's diet is immediately adjusted and monitored throughout his enti their entire life. So as it is, Gelsinger, um, during his entire life, lived on a strict non-protein diet and controlled his OTC deficiency fairly well. So Gelsinger volunteered for a gene therapy experiment designed to test possible treatments. And he thought that volunteering could help newborns affiliated, uh, afflicted with OTC deficiency. This gene therapy experiment involves the injection of a vector carrying normal OTC gene into this liver. And the vector being used to deliver the OTC gene was adenovirus. Uh, as most of you would know, uh, it's uh, a modified version of the virus that causes the common cold. Kelsinka was informed that previous subjects had received uh, adenovirus without serious complications. Unfortunately, he had a negative reaction to the injection and died four days later. So he is the first publicly known person to have died in a clinical trial related to gene therapy. So there are a number of ethical issues that have emerged from this particular case and in gene therapy as a whole. Many of these issues are common to experiments involving human volunteers. Some are unique to gene therapy. An ethical question that was raised in the Gelsinger case was whether relatively healthy adult volunteers with OTC deficiency, such as Gelsinger, should have been used as a subject. At first, it was suggested that babies born with OTC deficiency can be used in the experiment with their parents' consent. So why not simply experiment on newborns that had OTC since they were already very sick? If infants were to be used, their parents would have to give informed consent first. A concern was raised as to whether parents with very sick newborns could really understand that gene therapy experiments were risky and probably would not help their baby. So in contrast, adults with the condition could understand the risk and weigh them against the experiment's potential benefits. 
adults were chosen because they could better comprehend the risk of the experiment and provide informed consent. So at first it was thought that the vector that caused Gelsinger's death was relatively safe and that the deadly reaction was random and unforeseeable. However, um, as the investigation proceeds into Gelsinger's death, reports begin to emerge that the past research subjects and experimental animals had become sick from the vector. So this revelation raises the ethical concerns since these previous problems were apparently not correctly communicated to Gelsinger and the other volunteers. And these volunteers may have thus perceived the risk to be lower than it was uh, it is actually. So everyone has the right to determine whether they want medical treatment or decide to participate in an experiment given that information had been transparent. The notion that people should be fully informed and able to freely, uh, able to freely consent to participation in a research trial is accepted as a minimum requirement for the use of human subject in experiment. And then there's the other conflict of interest that was identified, whereby the lead scientist, Dr. Wilson, had financial interest in the development of the adenovirus vector, which was being used in the OTC gene therapy trial. If his gene therapy vector worked correctly and was successful, he could make a lot of money by using it to treat people or by selling it to other researchers or institutions. This conflict of interest may have influenced his decision um, as he continued with the clinical trial, despite of all those uh, negative evidence. So FDA investigation concluded that the scientists involved in the trial, including Dr. Wilson, um, broke several rules of conduct. But basically, um, what was the uh, what was the what was the punishment? It was basically um, that you, the university and the center that was involved in this case ended up paying five hundred thousand each. So is that enough, right? Uh, when uh, a life was taken, right? Um, again, this is a balance of a balance of science and um, safety, uh, which is still until today um, heavily debated. So what happened to Wilson? Um, his career was almost shut down um, after this uh, this incident. But since then, he has returned. Uh, his lab, the ones that got fined, um, has filled the gene therapy explosion. They, uh, they have a budget of 70 million a year to work on gene therapy itself. As for Dr. Wilson, he launched a startup called uh, Passage Bio in 2019, and almost immediately he got 115 million funding. 42 companies are using his adeno-associated virus, which uh, he has um, patents for. And that covers about 100 drug development programs today. So 11 of those um, have obtained licenses from one of his firm um, that he co-founded in 2009. So you know that's a question for us to reflect and debate on, right? Um, do we go for do we go for advancement of science? Um, I mean, if let's say uh, there was a significant negative reaction by the scientific community and the regulators at that time, uh, gene therapy wouldn't have been uh, where it is today, uh, with uh, a couple of them having uh, having been approved by FDA, but. Uh, what we, what we should reflect on is that obviously a life has been taken. And since then, um, a couple of lives have been taken uh, due to the uh, gene therapy clinical trials. 
Okay, let's go for uh, to the next one, which is, uh, I think I briefly shared about this in the previous workshop, um, BRCA1 and BRCA2, which are the two genes linked to susceptibility for breast and ovarian cancer. Um, the risk of falling ill increases if BRCA1 and BRCA2 shows certain mutations. Identifying the mutations is therefore important for diagnosis and for monitoring the higher risk women. Myri Genetics, with collaboration with University of Utah, were the first to sequence the BRCA1 genes, as I've shared, and applied for patent protection. Together with the University of Utah Research Foundation, Myrit holds two US patents on the isolated DNA coding for BRCA1 and on the screening method. So in uh, 1997, together with two other institutes, one in Canada and one in Japan, they also received patent protection on the isolated DNA sequence, which assert rights over a number of mutations in the gene. Further patent applications were filed on the second gene, BRCA2, in the US and in other countries. So what's so controversial about these uh, patents? The opponents challenged the patents on the basis of the patentability criteria, arguing that the claimed invention lacked novelty, inventive step, and industrial application, and that the patent failed to disclose the invention sufficiently for a person skilled to carry it out. So amidst these underlying technical grounds for opposition in relation to the patents were deeper ethical and policy concerns. So in addition to the continuing questions about patenting inventions derived from human genome that occurred naturally, the Myrick case raises concerns about the potentially limiting effects of patents on further research on the development of new test and diagnostic methods and on access to testing. While the considerable medical benefits of cancer screening technology were not in dispute, there were differing views about how the patent system should recognize such technology, if at all, and about how patents on such technology once granted should be exercised. So um, if you followed this case, um, in the end, they lost their patents um, in relation to the, 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 the sequence. Um, only in the US and certain parts of the world, uh, what this demonstrates is how the technical grounds of patentability should act as important safeguards of the public interest aimed at ensuring that patents are only granted on genuine advances in knowledge and are not used to exclude access to material in the public domain. So there is concern that some gene patents are, for example, drafted too broadly with the effect of overcompensating the patentee by covering all future applications. So there has to be a balance and that remains a difficult one and a challenge for um, the regulators and the company. For as long as society relies largely on private entities to invest in developing new genetic research-based treatments and diagnostic, Biotechnology companies like Myrit uh, will continue to want some degree of exclusivity in compensation for the investment poured into their research. So much of the debate uh, surrounding the Myrit case, however concerned, as I said, not the validity of the patents, um, although they were disclaimed in the end, in US, similar patents held by other entities have not attracted that kind of same criticism, but it's rather the ethics of how the patents rights were exercised commercially um, that is the issue. So Myrit's critics charge that it's licensing policy 
and the high prices demanded for testing under the patented technologies had the effect of preventing other labs in countries where the patent was enforced from carrying out diagnostic testing. The case raised questions as to whether, and if so, how regulators should step in to deal with concerns about licensing practices. Now let's go to the most recent case, which is CRISPR babies. Um, as we know, it's human germline genome editing. Um, and at this point, it's clearly human subject research. Whether or not the edited embryo is a human subject, the prospective parents are, as in the woman who is to carry the pregnancy. That means in almost all countries with significant human medical research and regulations, any effort to make a baby through human germline genome editing will have to be reviewed by the IRB or the equivalent and will have to be judged to have potential benefits to the subject or to the science of medicine that justify their risk and must provide a good informed consent. In China, um, as we will know later, any genetic manipulation of human embryos for reproductive purposes is prohibited. But um, after all this, um, in 2018, news broke of two germline edited babies in China. And how did this happen? without much um, fun there. It started when He Jiankui, a scientist in China, proposed to a HIV infected couple, um, sorry, to HIV infected couples, a technique that may be able to produce an IVF baby naturally immunized against AIDS. In a nutshell, the genome editing tool CRISPR was used to alter a gene in IVF embryos to cripple production of an immune cell surface protein, C CR5, that HIV uses to establish an infection. So what intrigued the couples are that their children could also pass the protective mutation to future generations. The prospect of this irrevocable genetic change is why since the advent of CRISPR as a genome, the editing of human embryos, eggs or sperm has been hotly debated. The core issue is whether such germline editing would cross an ethical red line because it could ultimately alter our species. So let's go back to Sanjin again. The two couples agreed to volunteer. Um, her study was up and running, and he would enroll six other couples. It proceeded quietly until the news broke in November 2018, days before the second international submit on genome editing in Hong Kong, which he was due to speak. Um, so scientists and ethicists condemned her medical rationale when they found out about this, because the experiment um, and worried that it is unnecessarily um, because it puts these girls at risk. And people in the field confronted an uncomfortable truth, which is that regulations and the scientific community's efforts to control CRISPR's powers at field. He lost his university position his leadership in the biotech company he founded and was sentenced to three years jail in China. So what is so controversial? Um, her team, they activated a perfectly normal gene in an attempt to reduce the risk of a disease that neither child had. So I think whatever that he did subsequently, I think would be considered reckless and naive. He made new mutations, and there's no reason to think that they'll be protective or even that they'll be safe. For example, it appears that her could manage to edit half of one of the twins 
CCR5 genes, the rest are normal. And in both twins, he failed to complete the full 32 base pair deletion that confers increased resistance to HIV infection. So, but here, but her appears to have leapfrog over all the basic checks and implanted the edited embryos into a woman. The children are tested subject. Uh, the, the children are test subjects for variants that haven't been vetted in animals. He relied on an AIDS association to reach out to the patients and falsely described his work as an AIDS vaccine development project. So he didn't use the right consent form as well. And by his own admission, he didn't inform his institution, the Southern University of Science and Technology about the experiment. He quietly, quietly took unpaid leave um, to perform this um, um, trial. So he claimed that he received ethical approval, um, but the uh, from a hospital, but the hospital denied that their medical ethics committee approved of such a project and that the signatures on hers approval form was expected to have been forged. So even though her spoke at scientific conferences about his gene editing research in other animals, he only discussed his ambition to edit human embryos with a select few. Um, those include Michael Tim, also I believe under investigation because he played an active role in the project and was reportedly present in China when the patients were um, consented. And then other scientists were not supportive and some were upset at him for him being reckless and naive, but he had consulted prominent scientists in the field, um, which includes Mark DeWitt, UC Berkeley, Stephen Quack, which was his former advisor from Stanford University, and Matthew Proteus. So no one stopped him or thought of informing the relevant bodies or his university for that fact, some due to the issue of trust, since her trusted that they will keep this information confidential. So at the end of the day, this is a failure of self-regulation by the scientific community towards the public. In contrary to mainstream belief that every fetus has a sign, have, has a right to remain genetically unmodified. There is also the thought that parents hold the right to genetically modify their offspring and that every child has the right to be born free of preventable diseases. This is debatable, but should a balance be determined to allow for the safe use of germline engineering for improved health and life? Or would this fail be stunted by the careless approach of that one scientist? Right. So now let's go to licensing and partnership deals. Um, we will talk about in, uh, in licensing first, as most of you are um, anyway from research institutions or universities. As a startup, you may have encountered various licenses in your dealings with the universities and research institutions. So I have listed a couple of key ones here. The first is the commercial evaluation to option license agreement, which are short-term non-exclusive license agreements to allow a licensee to conduct feasibility testing, but not to, not to sell products developed from the technology. These typically run no longer than a few months and have a modest cost associated with them and include relevant materials that are supplied by inventors. Some universities may also use this type of agreement in the form of a short-term exclusive option agreement for a nascent technology with the hope that a long-term diagnostic vaccine or therapeutic product commercialization, which is below here, license agreement will later be completed. 
fit. So this is a step before that. Then we have the internal commercial use license agreement, which is also again non-exclusive license agreement that allows a licensee to use but not to sell the technology in its internal programs. Here, the materials, either patented or unpatented, are provided. The financial structure of this agreement can either be a paid up term license or annual royalty payments each. However, without any rich true royalty obligations to other products being used or discovered by the licensee. I'll explain in a bit what rich true is, but let's talk about paid up term license. Paid up term license would be a license in which the company makes a one-time lump sum payment to obtain the rights to use the license technology for the duration of the license. On the other hand, rich true royalty provisions in a license agreement creates royalties to the licensor on the future sales of downstream products that are discovered or developed through the use of licensed technology, even though the final end product may not contain the licensed technology. In other words, rich true royalties are royalties that are due to a licensor, even though manufacture, use, or the sale of the final product does not infringe any patents claiming the license technology. Internal commercial use agreements themselves historically have been very popular with medium to large biomedical firms who are eager to acquire reagents. Um, to speed their internal development programs or to license um, technology that include animal models and receptors. Research product commercialization license agreement, again, is non-exclusive, but allows a licensee to sell products to the research products market. Here, materials either patented or unpatented are also generally provided with smaller firms predominating as licensees. The financial structure of these licenses involve low upfront royalties, but high earned royalty payments, since the materials provided are frequently close or very close to the finished product that is to be sold. Popular research product licensed in this manner include a wide variety of monoclonal, polyclonal antibodies or other research materials used in basic research. Then we have the vaccine diagnostic therapeutic or medical device product commercialization license document, which is um, what um, most spin-offs will be involved in. Agreements that can be exclusive if such is necessary for product development due to the capital and risk involved for the licensee. Important to note is that bio entrepreneurs um, and small capable biomedical firms usually receive preference from universities or publicly funded research institutions as exclusive licensees. A detailed development plan with product benchmarks or milestones is expected for licenses in this area. Collaborative research with the institutions regarding further preclinical or clinical development of the technology is encouraged, but it's not required in order to obtain a license and is negotiated separately by the individual lab. The final structure of this license can involve substantial upfront royalties, but much more moderate earned royalties, since the technology is typically not close to the finished product and appropriate benchmark payments. So other provisions to be negotiated include a share amount of sub-licensing proceeds as well as licensee performance, monitoring, and audit requirements. 
inter-institutional agreements are often used for exclusive licensing as many commercialized technologies will often have inventors from more than one university or research institution due to the ongoing collaboration. So if a bio entrepreneur is seeking to obtain an exclusive commercialization license to a technology to, due to the level of investment or risk involved, it is important to obtain the rights from all the institutions involved, especially for patent rights, as all owners have this ability to license separately. Thankfully, um, the joint owners most often um, than not um, of this single technology will pool their rights with a single party for patent and licensing purposes through an inter-institutional agreement. So such agreements provide significant convenience and time saving for bio entrepreneurs since they would have to negotiate with only one research institution to secure an exclusive license to the technology. So generally, it's considered good business practice in licensing from a research institution that the organization would standardize license terms to the extent possible. So standardizing financial and non-financial license terms levels the playing field for licensees an important thing for public institutions and universities and creates a common understanding of the balance of risk acceptable to a research institution. Uh, this may differ market reform for profit sector. So the royal, let's look at the royalty payments. The royalty payments themselves consist of license payments received for execution royalties minimum annual royalties, which is received regardless of the amount of product sales, earned royalties, which is a percentage of product sales, benchmark royalties, which go by milestones, and payments for patent cost. Some institutions have not sought equity payments in licenses or directly participated in company startups, Due to conflict of interest concerns, instead, in view of equity, the institution can consider equity like benchmark royalties that track successful commercial events of the company. However, many do take equity payments in their license agreement as a way to assist the new startup companies, even though there is considerable risk in accepting equity in view of cash payments since such equity is illiquid and has no present value at the time license is executed. So licensing institution will often opt to take an equity or equity-like position when available from the licensees for several reasons. So one is that equity would provide for additional revenue in addition to the licensing royalties, especially if the license product built in development, but the company itself later becomes successful and it happens. Equity can also be seen as a risk premium for research institution that provides additional inducement to grant the license to a new startup company versus a more established firm. Importantly, and perhaps most important for you, equity allows a licensee who is cash poor but equity reach to substitute an ownership pay, uh, position for an upfront licensing fee and at a reduced royalty rate. Finally, research institution accept this risk to support its mission to assist in commercialization of early stage technologies, which may not be turned into marketable products otherwise, and to encourage small business development. However, all universities or research institutions recognize that holding ownership rights in a startup company creates potential conflict of interest as mentioned earlier and adopt various internal policies that mitigate and manage such conflicts. 
unlike the corporate counterparts, inventors at non-profit research institutions most often and do receive a share of the royalties. I think that question was asked last week, um, generated from licensing of their inventions. So however, each institution might have slightly different revenue sharing policy with respect to the percent of licensing revenues that are shared with institutions. Having invested in the technology via supporting the protection of patent rights, the academic institution is first and foremost eager to reimburse themselves for the patent cost incurred. A license is their exit as we do M&A or IPO to be an exit. And the minimum terms of this exit is to recoup patent cost and further a modest signing fee um, is appropriate at time of the signing of this license. The statistics are that most technologies are not developed by the first licensee of the technology, but by the company's further licensee, which is the sub license. So this could be in the agreement. Typically, sub license happens when the original company licensee developed and validated the technology further. Depending on the situation, a fixed percentage or a sliding scale of percentage sub license income back to the original licensor is considered equitable. A certain percentage of royalty on net sales of the product comes back to the licensor to ensure diligent development, having a set annual payment is customary. Sometimes this is term annual maintenance fee that is credited against royalty upon product launched. Next, we discuss what might be some of the typical licensing agreement non-financial clauses that you would come across in dealing with a non-profit research institution. First, the breadth of rights. This depends on the technology that is being licensed and the size and the need of the company. If the patent rights technology is specific to a certain company's drug, for example, something that arose from a sponsored research agreement, then it would be typical to give the company exclusive license rights to all fields available within the patent rights. For diagnostic technologies, the trend is to grant non-exclusive rights to the technology if possible, but with an eye towards incentivizing the companies to invest into developing the technology. For research tool technologies, it is standard practice to give several companies non-exclusive access to use the technologies in their internal research for example, in the drug discovery programs. For startups founded on university research institutions in order for fledging company to attract investments, a broader field of use is appropriate. Academic centers are required to reserve rights for their continued use of the technology for further research. So typically the academic center reserves rights not only for its own use, but also for the research use of other academic centers. So for instance, the hospital, this uh, for hospitals, this would include clinical research use as well science since patient care is part of the institution mission. So the reason for the reserve rights clause is for licensees not to block anyone from continuing research on the technology that could benefit the public given that it was funded by the tax dollars from the public in the first place. Patents rights um, enforceability. Patent rights are enforced by the owner or in cooperation from the owner. So let's say if an infringer of the technology is hurting the market share of a licensee. As the patent owner, meaning the universities or research institutions, they will be affected since the patent licensee is affected. Typically, exclusive licensees seek to get first right to go after the infringers, but these actions 
buy the licenses by drag the uh, technology transfer offices into lawsuits and potential invalidation of the patent claims. So academic centers do not have the appetite for lawsuits. A common approach is therefore to have the first right to pursue infringers when informed by the licensees by to encourage them to take a license uh, from the licensees. Failing which, then it's typical to have the licensee pursue the infringers. Academic medical centers have to protect themselves from lawsuits that may arise from patients who may be injured by the product that companies make or sell. So what uh, when sponsored research is performed and broad access is given to all results that arise from the collaborations, judicious use of the results in the drug development process is the company's responsibility. So in this agreement, companies are required to provide evidence that they have the necessary backing via insurance protection. And this clause is usually non-negotiable. Then conflict of interest is another one, which is very significant and a real issue, particularly for teaching hospitals, academic medical centers, and research institutions that are doing both clinical and basic research. Conflicts are managed by ensuring that at the time of the licensing of inventions to a company related to a certain drug, the medical center does not have any sponsored research collaboration on the same drug with the same investigator whose invention or technology was licensed. Also, the investigator cannot consult for the company whose drugs are in clinical trials under his or her guidance. Now, let's go to out licensing since we've gone through the in licensing. Um, which is either considered, um, so out-licensing um, um, has been used um, by startups as a means of cash flow generation and at times as a form of business model for the firm. Um, there are two common strategies used. One is front-loading and the other one is back-loading. The difference between front and back loading lies in the risk and rewards. This is taken at the beginning for back loading in return for higher rewards in terms of upfront and milestone payments and royalty at a later time. And at present where the uh, investments into startups are on the rise, um, IPOs are also on the rise, the startup has a choice um, to go for the backloading strategy and in fact would prefer this um, to that of front loading. So these are typically, they're, they're basically, in other words, they have um, different avenues to raise funds in order to develop their product and company further. Whereas front loading typically starts with out licensing of um, Pre clinical candidates. Um, Backloading comes into play when a startup intends to expand outside of its own country. So, depending on the product and stage of development, both the amount and timing of upfront and milestone payments may vary. So, these are just examples, it's not necessarily um, the gospel. Um, so for example, phase one drug may justify a 2 million upfront and a 20 million in milestones. Wells in the same program in phase two, demonstrating efficacy might command five times more. So total value of deal depends on whether the partner will pay for the future development cost, buy equity and pay royalty. So what are the key components um, in deal making in terms of this um, out licensing? The cost of running an R&D program can be significant and it helps to have a partner 
cover all of parts of the expenses. That's the motivation for our licensing, including cost of in-house labors and outsourcing expenses, process and clinical development. Some may too quickly agree to work for their partners in exchange for little more than having their expense reimbursed due to being eager for validation of their technology or generating revenue. Such arrangements are, in fact, just profit neutral, not hurting, but not helping your bottom line. Companies that neglect to partake in significant upside of drug sales may in fact become just a little more than the CRO, which is covering their costs, but not generating levels of profit to justify the high valuation, and also considering management benefits. Partnerships involving research sponsorships while profit neutral may distract management from their ambitious goals. A research sponsorship gives company doing R&D little incentive to be more efficient since cost savings are enjoyed by the paying partner, not you. Instead, an alternative to counting um, the FTEs is to negotiate a success-based milestone which rewards efficiency. A new partner may make an equity investment in a smaller company and as a form of payment. Usually, valuation of the stocks is inflated relative to what ordinary investors would pay for since the new partner is getting more than just the stock out of this deal. Equity purchases are reported as investment on the balance sheet transaction instead of as cash expense on the income statement, which lowers your reported earnings. The partner usually will not acquire more than 20% of the stock if company X owns 20% or more of loss generating company and an equal percentage of Y's losses would have to be included on X income statement, therefore lowering the X reported earnings and hurting their stock price. So loans are also a form of payment particularly when they are interest-free, convertible to stock, or potentially forgivable. A royalty is a payment based on product sales. Royalties may be a flat percentage of sales or tiered. 10% of annual sales up to 100 million, 12% up to 100, uh, 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 more than 100 million, 14% on sales of more than 300 million. So you'll see that kind of tiered um, percentage. Compared to marketing on drug, one advantage of receiving sales-based royalties from partner is that you get paid even when the drug is not yet generating profits. While royalty payments may be too far off to provide a startup with the cash flow it needs to grow, Royalties are an effective means of generating significant value in the long term and earn percentage point is worth negotiating for. Royalties are also larger than they seem. Um, for example, a typical phase two stage deal may include a 10% royalty on worldwide sales with the pharma company covering your future expenses. Therefore, when the drug is generating $500 million a year, the pharma company will keep the $450 million and give you the $50 million. However, after manufacturing sales and other expenses, the pharma company may be left with just $250 million, which would mean that um, your company's 10% sale-based royalty, in fact, represents 20% profits. One rarely see licensing agreement which the marketing company pays the developer a royalty in excess of 30%. This is because royalty that is 30% of sales would roughly be equivalent to 50% of profits. Considering the huge effort and expense of marketing a drug, it would require very unusual circumstances for a farmer to part with more than 50% of its profits. Theoretically, if clinical data suggested the product will be a blockbuster, um, 
a farmer might still pay generously for less than 50% of the profit. A company developing a drug may agree to share in the ongoing development and commercialization cost of the drug, including the high cost associated with first launching a new product in exchange for also proportionally sharing the drug in the drug's profits. This means that both partners accept the risk that the drug might never be approved or become profitable. However, just because two companies enter into profit sharing does not mean that the company that discovered and partially developed the drug will not be paid upfront fees and milestones. In fact, these payments from partner may be what allows the company to shoulder its share of the ongoing commercialization cost. FDA regulations concerning GMP of drugs are very strict as we know it and a factory that fails an inspection may be promptly shut down, possibly resulting in product recall and millions of dollars lost in sales. Therefore, usually the big pharma are generally hesitant to trust inexperienced biotech companies with manufacturing and will negotiate for this right during partnership discussion. Since manufacturing drug is a step towards maturity and full integration, young companies may try to retain the rights eventually to manufacture the drug and sell it at a slight markup to the marketing partner. While often used interchangeably, there is a fundamental difference between co-promotion and co-marketing. If two companies agree to co-promote a drug, this means that both will deploy their sales force collaboratively to sell a drug under a single brand name. When co-marketing, each will sell the drug under a different brand name, as if they were two entirely different drugs and may avoid competing with each other by targeting different markets. Co-marketing arrangements are rare, Amgen sells this compound as apogen in the US for renal market license to J&J &J that sells as appropriate for other indications, notably cancer in the US and for all indications outside of the US. This kind of arrangement may lead to squabbles um, whenever one appears to encroach on the other's territory. Co-promotion arrangements, on the other hand, are not uncommon and make sense if one company lacks the sales force to penetrate a market to which another company could sell effectively. So for example, while a biotech company developing a drug for overactive bladder might build its own 100% sales force to target 12,000 uh, urologists, um, the same company would be hard pressed to build a 3,000 person sales force to market this drug to hundreds of thousands of primary care physicians. So therefore the biotech company might end, uh, partner with a pharma giant that could target this um, uh, larger market while allowing the biotech company to co-promote the drug the smaller and more tractable urology market. Most importantly, the bigger partner will cover the cost of the smaller company hiring and maintaining its sales force. Biotech company may prefer um, core promotion that involves sharing of sales revenue and expenses, essentially profit sharing, rather than royalty paying deals. The contributions to the biotech company's bottom line may be the same in either case, but a co-promotion deal lets the biotech company report substantially more in top-line revenues. Booking top-line sales of a drug product is considered more prestigious than merely collecting royalties, in other words. The former is indicative of a more mature company with sales and marketing capabilities. However, do note that not all co-promotion allow both partners to book sales to their respective top lines. 
in many cases, all sales will be credited to the bigger partner who then pays royalties to the smaller biotech company. The biotech is paid equally whether it co-promotes the drug or just lets the partner handle sales. However, by exercising this co-promotion option, you get free sales force that can be leveraged to sell other drugs if you are developing or in licensing. Therefore, a co-promotion deal is important um, if you want to take a big step for to mature into a fully integrated company. Some deals between companies involve the, the creation of a third entity, which is a joint venture, which may be nothing more than a paper company to which each partner owns a portion. The JV may be funded by the bigger partner, or it may be funded by both and would have scientific and admin staff from one of the partner or maybe both and may receive licenses to each of the partner's relevant tech. For example, the larger partner may agree to pay for all the work being done by the JV. The JV may in turn make payments to the smaller partner for the use of its people, equipment, lab space and IP. At some point, the JV might agree to license a drug to the drug larger partner, which would pay royalties to the JV. Eventually, that money would find its way to the smaller partner. So the JV is really just an accounting construct where one or both partners may favor over direct transaction because of how a JV may affect the financial statements. Okay, let's go to growth stages and value of corporate culture. Um, what are the stages? Um, for those who are founders, the startup phase is an exciting experience and yet at times it can seem frightening because it feels as if you are staring at the vast unknown. When establishing a new company, there is excitement, anticipation, expectation of the future. In reality, the startup phase is the most fragile of all the growth stage of the company, and many do not proceed past this stage for multitude of reasons. They have no roadmap or best practices to guide them, and yet the opportunity is unlimited. However, success is dependent on the creative ideas and inherent ability of the founders to create and build something of great value. In all startups, there is usually one or more founders and occasionally a very small team of individuals who may be working part-time or operating in consulting capacity at the newly formed company. If the technology is owned by a research or academic institution, key activities will be to negotiate and secure the license, secure or file patents, set up proper corporate structure and formalized agreements between the company and the founders, including issuing stocks and creating a business plan. In addition to these corporate activities, there will be a multitude of product development activities to move product forward to milestones and raise startup um, and seed capital. During this stage, the bio entrepreneur will be accomplishing or overseeing almost everything while trying to get the company properly established. The entrepreneur may already have a full-time job, which means working long hours, weekends, or night. So the bio entrepreneur quickly learns that regardless of what their expertise is, they must be good um, and they must adapt at everything. During this stage, um, the bio entrepreneur will be shaping the future and direction in which the organization will be headed. Because the entrepreneur will be the only individual with the completeness of the vision for, for the organization and the product, he or she will be leading the organization in a command and control style, which means that all decisions are being made by one leader who then directs the work of others and evaluate the outcomes. This leader makes the decision about these outcomes as to their appropriateness compared to what is required in the ultimate goal. 
During this time, all team members will be depending on the leader for direction and to make quality decisions. Therefore, the leader cannot be tentative or be someone who backslides in their decisions. The leader must know their goals and know how the team will be able to achieve them, even if some of these goals are still being determined along the way. The absence of a strong visionary leader and poor strategy or poor execution will result in the demise of the startup before you have given a chance to transition to the next phase. Now, the early development phase, an organization has made a significant transition from startup to development. At this stage, there are still only a handful of individuals who are responsible for accomplishing the company's goals. These individuals may still be working part-time, operating in a consultancy capacity, or there may occasionally be, be a full-time employee or two, depending on the funding situation. At this phase, an initial funding event will have occurred and the company will have some capital to work with for advancing the product further along in development. The company is most often operating as virtual still, where most of the activities are contracted out to others, including labs of the original inventors. The early development phase require, uh, requires still a strong leader with a clear vision as with the startup phase and a strategic plan because all activities are essential and need to be completed and everything seems equally important. Still without clear priorities, nothing will be completed in a timely manner. And the leader must continually communicate the corporate plans and the product values to internal and external stakeholders. At this stage, the leader must still manage with command and control and Although at this stage, there should be team members who the leader can trust to share a portion of that leadership responsibility. In the mid-development phase, the company has been building internal capabilities, but it still outsources most of their activity. Um, however, most of these are slowly being integrated and supported within the organization. Major funding has provided them with ample working capital for additional hires to expand internal functions. Product development progresses um, and to reach the key milestones and the company is overcoming many challenges encountered um, during the product development. Preliminary meetings are occurring with potential partners and public relations is resulting in some recognition for the company. Then we moved on to the late development phase. The leader must now have made a complete transition from a command and control to a delegate and inspect management style. By now, the hired managers and employees have sufficient expertise and possess untapped capabilities which will be underutilized if the leader fails to transition to this stage. Regarding management style, the leader should be focused on articulating the important and strategic business goals for senior management and provide the team with measurable goals to evaluate the progress. And at this stage, they will either equip the management team with outside um, experience, that means the externals that they bring internally now, or they would aim to promote um, individuals that have been working um, in the company for a long time. So one of the reasons why we want to do this kind of um, internal promotion is that by now the individuals whom a leader manages usually would possess more knowledge and understanding about the problem or situation than the leader themselves. Therefore, these individuals are the ones that are best to make certain decisions. And this is true for all levels and departments. 
So if the management style does not transition, employees become ineffective and usually would find non-productive activities to occupy their unused capacity. Or more often than not, they will leave to find more challenging positions or employment. Now, we've reached the early expansion stage. Um, it's where you have successfully passed the hurdles of product development and have received regulatory approval in most cases. And now are manufacturing the product and expanding the market for the product. By now, the company will have made some mistakes along the way, but none have been beyond repair and these are corrected quickly. Management must maintain still a startup mentality and not set up bureaucracy that impedes the company's agility and its ability to respond quickly. Management's challenge will be that of balancing a standard process infrastructure, but maintaining the flexibility and creativity that was a strength in their previous development stage. At this stage, the company's product is in the market and much activity is concentrated around executing the market strategy, managing marketing channels, manufacturing activities, and reimbursement challenges for medical products. Companies now must execute their plan and monitor their external environment for changes that impact them and their products. And at this phase, the management style has become more similar to the larger corporate entities, yet it's still relatively flat in comparison, meaning that there are still very few layers of management. The company should still have the ability to make decisions in a way that takes advantage of a smaller company strength. The management focus should include training more leaders at new levels of the organization, rather than just managing tasks. As, this, as these new leaders can impact a greater portion of the organization as its skill. The leadership and management are quite capable of handling development and growth needs, but they still experience a few crises every now and then. Communication is vital as always within the organization and management should ensure that all employees feel they are informed about the progress of the company. The companies that reach the late expansion phase are successful in their own right. They have developed great capabilities, are efficient producers, manufacturers, marketers of their products, and are increasing their market share. Examples of these um, of companies that have reached this stage are like Amgen, Gentech, Biogen, and Genzyme. And for some of these companies, um, they have gone on to be acquired or to merge with larger organizations. Um, and obviously, at this stage, they have become more bureaucratic and institutionalized, like the corporates. The company is focused on marketing strategy, reimbursement, manufacturing, improving quality, and new product development, as previous. If the company is not acquired or their first product is not licensed to a marketing partner, they may be financing activities through mezzanine or capital expansion. Uh, one key characteristic of successful companies at this stage is clear and frequent communication from management to staff and employees. As organizational structure enlarges, communication channels tend to break down when this occurs, corporate communication problems begin. The absence of information can cause employees to think and presume information that may or may not be true. So several things can help a successful transition through this stage. One activity is frequent and meaningful communications between the leader, the senior staff, and all levels of organizations. Now, at the decline phase, this happens when a company fails to move ahead of its competition um, or when they struggle during the late expansion phase and fail to continuously innovate while facing internal and external challenges. 
So obvious signs of a decline is the decrease in sales and profitability and high attrition rate. Now let's look at the funding stages. The average amount of capital raised during each funding stage can vary greatly within each biotech industry. The amount of money that is raised during any stage is influenced by various factors, right? Um, such as the market size, the technology, product, the team running it, um, and also obviously the buyer, um, buyer's motivation, uh, the, sorry, the investor's motivation. So the type of product being developed um, as well. So let's look at this, right? Um, therapeutics, biologics, and vaccines will generally require greater amounts of capital during each round than do most medical diagnostic, medical devices, point of care, um, laboratory retest um, startups. These companies developing the former products will be raising larger amounts of capital in each round compared to the later group. How much one can raise depends on the financial market's interest, as I said, motivation. And in the disease segment, as in the market at the time of raising capital. Investors' interest in certain disease um, segments changes over time. So in the past, for example, it was antisense DNA um, as well as antisepsis therapy. Things. In most recent year, it was genomics, proteomics, RNAi, and in this last few years, CRISPR and AI uh, drug discovery and diagnostic. So the success and failure of similar predecessor products influence the value placed on the company and affect the eagerness of the investors to fund these companies. Um, the strength of the IPO and acquisition um, is also another thing um, that would be determined at the time of raising capital and it will definitely impact the startup's ability to raise funds. When financial markets as a whole increase or decline, it impacts the amount of money that can be raised for any development stage company. Be aware that general condition of the economy and financial markets can thus impact the amount of capital you raise at any one time. Now let's look at corporate culture in brief. Every company is unique uh, in their culture that's because of the mix of employee, the manner in which um, one conducts a business. So you can say that each company has a personality of its own. Typically, the collective characteristics of a company are referred to as corporate culture. A company's culture is tangible, meaning that outsiders and uh, customers can sense a real difference between one company's employees and those of another. So for instance, one company may have a culture of um, innovation, excitement and collaboration and of motivating employees to ignore the traditional work hours and do whatever is necessary to get a job done. So you see this more often in tech um, startups. And then you have another company that uh, is a minimalist culture that where the, uh, the employees um, go back uh, uh, in time and do only what is required based on their job description. So it, um, your corporate culture will be a strength or a weakness. Every company encounters problems and challenges. And it seems like biotech companies have more than their fair share of them. We'll see some uh, one example of that. But the corporate culture of a company is a good predictor of the ability to overcome crisis. For a biotech startup, developing corporate culture may not seem like a high priority compared to the other things that you need to do from product development, regulations, uh, finding money, hiring teams, right? But it is still critical to pay attention to the development of culture because at some point the company reaches a critical mass and like concrete, the culture of the organization is set. 
A company may temporarily ignore the development of a corporate culture without much consequence, but at some point, this will impact the ability to effectively accomplish objectives, and especially as the company grows larger. So one thing is certain, there will be a company culture, whether by design or default. Every company's corporate culture is different and there is no universal culture that is optimal for everyone. So you need to choose to purposefully create a culture that adds strengths rather than on that is divisive or detrimental to progress. As previous, um, so as previously discussed, all companies will transition through different phases of growth and everything does not always work out exactly as planned. Internal and external changes and adjustments are inevitable as a company grows. Your corporate culture will be a help or hindrance in overcome, uh, overcoming these challenges in product development and organizational growth. But fortunately, most of you will begin with an entrepreneurial culture that is energetic, creative, and persevering. Now, every individual would define the corporate culture and core values, as you can see in the slide. An organizational strength is the sum total of all these individual strengths. And each employee makes decisions based upon their own knowledge and the core values. And employees with a core value of mutual respect for others does not think about how they may leave an unfinished task for another employee to complete. Someone with a core value of acceptance or responsibility for one's actions will admit mistakes rather than cover it up or blame someone else. So we will see this um, in the Tylenol, Tylenol example later. So, it's important because what seems minor, but if you add up the hundreds to thousands of employees, then this becomes the prevailing culture of the organization. So values that are demonstrated to apply um, to senior management will be reinforced, embraced, and even respected by all employees. So senior management should be an example throughout the organization. Core values can be thought of as the seeds of the organization's future. The selection and incorporation of a particular set of core values will bear the fruit innate to those values. So core values must be translated into guiding principles, which is important because it helps guide individuals to better understand how the organization desires them to make decisions to operate and to act. So examples, um, in 1982, seven consumer deaths occurred when these individuals ingested a tainted Tylenol extra strength capsule laced with cyanide. This crisis situation has been analyzed at business schools around the world and is an example of how to successfully respond to crises. Um, so Otto McNeil, which is a Johnson & Johnson company, responded according to their corporate culture of putting first the well-being and needs of the people they serve. It was quickly discovered, though, that these capsules were tampered with after they left the manufacturer and the contamination was no fault of the company. However, the executives make the decision to own up to it, right, to take responsibility they immediately recalled 31 million bottles of the Tylenol, um, which costed them um, hundred millions of dollars. And to further protect the public, they made an effort, uh, they made an announcement not to consume products containing Tylenol for the time being. So most interesting is that this type of crisis, crisis management was not really taught to the employees, nor was it rehearsed um, response. It was later recognized that this was due in part to the organization's core values, as I mentioned uh, earlier, to put the people first, established by the founders and which was guided, um, uh, which was the guiding principles for the employees in making this decision. So Otto McNeil possessed the company culture 
and core values that were an asset, but these values only became visible to the public as a result of this crisis. So let's look at an example of something that was a liability, and this is the uh, downfall of Terranos. Um, the Terranos culture is not one which we should aspire to emulate. If you're, an, uh, if you're not up to speed, Elizabeth Holmes founded Terranos when she was only 19 years old, and the aim was to revolutionize the US healthcare industry. So she raised hundreds of millions of dollars um, from investors over the years for a device called Edison and claimed this would upend the $60 billion blood testing industry by requiring only a finger prick of blood to run hundreds of tests that typically require valves of cleaners of blood. So Holmes even inked a multi-million dollar deal with Wolf Queens and had all-star board of directors from a former Secretary of State to a Secretary of Defense. And all this while, the company was basking in this glory of Wall Street and global media hype the, that positioned Holmes as the next Steve Jobs. And at, this, at, the, at her peak, or at their peak, investors valued the company at $9 billion, making her the youngest self-made female billionaire. However, all um, started to go downhill. Um, the problem is because the devices didn't work. Instead, Taranos was using traditional blood testing methods and equipment, uh, and this was not known, in fact, and even sending customers wildly inaccurate test results. So it all came crashing when Wall Street Journal article exposes the problems between Taranos um, which sparked an investigation um, by the regulators. The corporate tale is so compelling, so you should read the, the bad blood um, to learn more. But what we want to focus on today is to understand more fully how Holmes was able to sustain for more than a decade such an incredibly toxic culture, which hid the truth. It is important to note that there is a major gap between employees' recognition of the importance of culture and how they experience it daily at work. And this was the case for Terranos, where ethical employees were um, you know, challenged in a culture that was deceiving customers, partners, investors, and regulators. In the staff interviews, um, you'll know that it's uh, these employees' actions were shaped by the culture of homes and church, which is a culture of fear. That culture had two main impacts. It either drove, drove the employees out or they were complicit knowingly or unknowingly in the Terranos scam. So Holmes fostered the culture of fear because it serves her needs, not the company's needs, not the public's needs. Early on, experts inside and outside the company questioned the technology. As years went by, whenever the employees or expert raises warnings, Holmes and her enforcers systematically shut down, ignored, bullied, or threatened those who dared to question Terranos. So this is the toxic culture that we do not want to be part of. So some may speculate that the idea could have worked, but there wasn't a productive and honest dialogue or collaboration to work through issues. So knowing that there would be repercussions, lawsuits or getting fired, employees just seem to keep their heads down and go along with the charade, thereby enabling the sham to continue for years. So until, um, until one of them um, acted out as a whistleblower, so the, perhaps the biggest red flag for the company's culture is when fear is the driving force, um, either on a team or the leadership staff. In fact, some of leaders who act on this don't even recognize they are cultivating fear or see the harm in such culture. So ultimately, fear results in bad decisions and hinders success. To understand if fear exists, companies must engage in regular and honest dialogue 
with employees to understand if there is even a hint of fear in their culture and they probably and that probably means allowing for anonymous input where employees at all levels can openly share their views and concerns. So leaders should carefully watch attrition rate, meaning why employees are leaving. Maybe it's the pay um, or the job is the wrong fit, but sometimes there's a bigger culture issue within the company and ensuring there is a process in place for candidate exit interviews in the first place. Again, this may need to be anonymous. If toxic culture trends are emerging, it's time to diagnose the culture problem and take action. So leaders often shy away from measuring culture because it seems um, uh, they seem to struggle to assess and manage it. And for certain, um, like homes, seem intentional about cultivating a culture of fear, and that's likely not the intent of most credible leaders in companies. So, but what if a culture of fear or any other type of unproductive culture that is harmful to your business is taking root? Maybe there's a rich leader or misaligned team that is permeating the company. It's not a far-fetched idea. So to ensure a healthy culture, leaders must clearly define, promote, assess, and retool the culture as needed. This means making culture someone's job and creating mechanisms to hold every single employee accountable for leaving the culture. So that's the end of today's workshop. Um, because of the limit of time, I've uh, told Kim that if you all have any questions, you can email me. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. I will forward Thank the you. questions to you later. Okay, bye. Thank you. Thanks, Ross. Thank you. Thank you.